Well, Rob, you ready to dive into the fourth world? I, I got to tell you, I can't believe you guys. I mean, this is the fourth fourth event I've 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 done panels for you guys. You are our, our number one unpaid intern. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, the people that you line up for me to talk to is an amazing joy. I mean, and the next Oscar I mean, winners. All, I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, like, uh, we're talking I, I, Tom King. And Cecil, uh, I, I don't want to mispronounce her name. Castellucci. Ca Castellucci. What she probably doesn't know is that she and I were in a movie together. Oh, my God. Well, yes, I'm we going to get out of your way, man, and, uh, and uh, you take it away. Rob, I, always good to talk to I, you. I, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great. Uh, I'll start in. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, however you identify from across the 28 known galaxies, as we, as we heard in Superman the movie, uh, I'm Robert Meyer Burnett once again, and I have a, a panel I'm so excited about, as we just announced who our panelists are. Uh, I can't say enough about Tom King. I mean, what a legend. And of course, Cecil, she has been a, uh, uh, she's been a, in a band. She's written novels. She has written a many, many a great comic. And she and I both appeared together in the movie Staroids. <laughs> that was about people lining up to see the Phantom Menace back in 1999. I didn't line up, but I tried to pay somebody to, uh, for their spot in line. And we're both in the same movie. So welcome them both to this panel. And we're going to get our Kirby on. <laughs> so, uh, Philadelphia, that's a fucking great title. Know, Isn't that a is. great title? I mean, I mean it's, it's amazing. It is a true honor to be with both of you. And I, I, you know, I, I feel like I should reach back and maybe I will. I'm going to reach back and pull off wow. this because this is my, one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> God love, God love DC for putting out Commandy and, and this. And and bringing the fourth world back. I mean, I guess it's never gone anywhere. Uh, between between the Snyder cut and what you guys are doing, <laughs> I think Dark Side's real now. Uh, it's it, it's going to be great. So, first of all, to jump right into it, I guess in, from the both of you, how do you each? How do you Hi, feel? Hey, oh, is it I, Cecil? Did I say Cecil? No, no, Cecil, 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 Cecil. They're both acceptable. But I just want to say it's my birthday today. And, oh, my God. Um, Happy birthday. This, so I can't, this is like the best birthday gift ever because I've always wanted to sit down and have a beer and talk fourth world with Tom. So this is a, uh, this is a great birthday present, Baltimore Comic Con. <laughs> well, I'm just going to be, I just like seeing your face. I miss, you know, we go to cons and we see each other all the time and then we just mm -hmm. disappear. And it's, uh, it's such a, I don't know, such a pleasure just to see. I did my first signing okay. ever in my life, and she was sitting next to me. That's, That's wow. right. That's so right. So many years ago. So uh, what a, well, yeah, it warms my heart. It makes me feel that the world might not end. Soon. Me too. Me too. <laughs> well, this, then it's a great, let me celebrate the joy. But, you know, to ask the two of you, um, having such deep comic roots as you have, what does Jack the King Kirby's fourth world mean to the two of you? And and when did you first discover the stories? I mean, did you read Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen? How how did you uh, discover the fourth world? And and what do you think about it? And and uh, how about the Black Racer? I'm a big Black Racer fan. Is he coming in? <laughs> oh, I go first. Uh, yeah, you go first. Go first. All right, I'll, no. I'll, uh, man, that's a, that's a bunch of questions. Let me see. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Growing up, I would say this is sadly typical of my generation um, of kids who sort of raised in the 90s, mm. where uh, I came to Kirby later. Like I came to him as a child, I saw Kirby as sort of I didn't like his art. I didn't. I went when I went through the back. I was a back issue hunter as a child, and when I found the Kirby, I was like, I don't, I don't know what this is. And I probably. <laughs> I probably first encountered the uh, Fourth World through John Byrne's Fourth World stuff, which I was sure. a big, big John Byrne fan as a kid, and then through Walt Simonson's um, Orion series, which I loved and read as as, as a little older kid. Um, and I didn't go back to the Kirby stuff until I think when I tried to go back into comics. So when I, you know, sort of made the transition from my other career, so I was in like my early thirties, I did. There was a list that. Um, uh, uh, it was like the like best hundred comics of all time, and uh, and on there was Kirby's first Fourth World. And that's when that's when I read it, and uh, uh, and um, you know, and you realize it's sort of you're reading the source code to comics at the same time. Yeah, it's very or the anti life equation, or the anti life equation. That's right. <laughs> and what about you? 
I mean, I'd always been aware of Kirby, but I think it's the same as Tom. Like I didn't, you know, it wasn't like that wasn't the my go to, you know, sort of um, person. Um, and for me, um, after I was finished with Shade the Change, I mean, after I was finished with Shade the Changing Girl, I, I guess, you know, Tom had just started um, Mr. Miracle and I was looking for a new project. And I actually was like, well, I can't do Female Furies because Tom's doing Mr. Miracle. So um, I'd gone through the encyclopedia of, um, you know, DC comic book characters and come into the DC offices with like a bunch of different teams and characters that I wanted to reboot. And um, after a conversation with Dan, um, I'd said something like, you know, he was uh, every single, every single team that I wanted to do, he's like, oh, you know, Jeff Lemire's doing that, or this person's <laughs> doing that, or whatever, you know, and it was all boy stuff. And I was like, oh, where's your Handmaid's Tale, you know? And he was like, if you can figure out the female furies and the Handmaid's Tale, then we can have a conversation. And, um, and then he went under his desk and he brought out the fourth world omnibus and was like, do, do your homework. And you got um, one for free, damn it. Yeah. And, and so I, um, I, I went in, I dove in and was just blown away by the robust, uh, intense world building and philosophical ideas and thought process about life and the meaning of life and the universe. And, um, love and hate and uh trauma um and uh i just i just thought it was incredible and so you know there are so many threads to pull on i'm sure you know tom agrees with me um and you know uh, but uh, for me you know I, I for me i found my story in mr miracle number no. nine but um but yeah it was it was and i didn't know whether or not like you know it was like here's your challenge gauntlet thrown um and then you know, even if nothing had ever happened, what a pure joy to just read that book and really sort of um, train at the, the foot of a master, I felt like. Well, I, I have to ask the two of you, um, do you have to pick a side? Do you have to pick New Genesis or Apocalypse? I mean, is it one or the other? Is it the dark or the light? Or or can you both sort of pick from both? I mean, did, did you have to choose? Do you have a, do, do you have a favorite side, I'm asking, I guess? I think part of the genius of the fourth world, why it has layers that you wouldn't expect it to, is it. At the first, it seems like a very cartoony. You know, you think, oh, this is just Kirby, sort of in his Hanna Barbera days with you know the stuff the six year olds, good guys versus bad guys. But then when you mm -hmm. actually look at New Genesis, you have sort of this underclass of bugs that are treated very poorly. Yeah. You you, you have this idea that explore extensively, but the idea that. High Father made this deal where he gave away his son in order to achieve a peace that didn't last, which is a pretty shitty thing for a dad to do. Uh, and, and it and, failed. And it failed. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a total. He, he gave up a son and, and to, he that totally he got to That he purposely did, to, that he purposely wanted to fail, yeah. you know, so that he could start a war again. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Continue, Tom. Continue. continue. But that's exactly it. Like there are, it's not as good guy versus bad guy mm -hmm. as you would first expect, with the exception of. Dark side sort of being this, you know, um, you know, the symbol for all everything Jack Kirby hated fascism and and um, the the lack of thought, the lack of freedom, um, so that you always root against him. But I mean, uh, so you asked me which side. I would say I think I think that um, probably Apocalypse has cooler characters. Yeah, um, I mean, you can't argue with the coolest of Dark Side with Kanto, with the Sod, uh, you know, with, with, with you know. Oh, Wonderburn. They're more fun on Dark Side side. Agree. Female Furies. Yeah, agree. Granny I mean, goodness. You know, Great. I think I think I think the Dark Side is always more interesting. You know, um, um, anyways, because there's more sort of drama inherent in um, in um, uh, as a writer, like you know, uh, putting the lens on that and trying to find the heart in in the in the you know in the fire pits. I guess you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm gonna go apocalypse as well. But at the same time, like they, they, you, you can't have one without the other. They, they, they work in tandem, and um, you know, there's a reason why it works. Once again, because we're really delving, you know, or Kirby was really delving into sort of what the human condition is, and you know, mm. sort of what our what our fundamental questions are of good, uh, good and evil, and how to make the world better. Um, but how trying to make the world better can sometimes. Uh, you can you can <laughs> really do it in a very wrong way, you know, tr by trying to make things um, what you think is better, and that's the danger, you know. Um, and I, I think that touches upon 
the sort of fascism stuff that he was very much against, you know? Well, now there's been different, like you pointed out, different artistic interpretations of the fourth world characters. And Darkseid has been a, a perennial favorite as a DC villain. We've seen him in, in the animated shows that were coming out. And and of course, he was in, in, in integral in things like Final Crisis and, and, and other large DC storylines. The Cosmic Odyssey that I just reread recently. Did you look to different runs throughout the history of not just what, what we saw in the omnibus, but like you talked, you both touched on previous runs. Is there a definitive uh, run of these characters for you, or is it just, do you always go back to the original Kirby? Uh, definitive. I mean, I think different people have done amazing things with the characters, but yeah, I think the, I don't think it's, I mean, Simon's, I mean, for pure art genius, uh, if you look at Simonson's Orion stuff, it, mm. it, you, you just can't, I, re, I reread that recently and I just, it, it's breathtaking the stuff he was doing, it's next level. And and if you, in, and it's not just his art where like, cause he did backups in each one. The backups are by Frank Miller, they're by Dave Gibbons. They're, yeah. by, they're by the best people in the industry at that time. So um, that would probably be, I mean like, yeah, to me, it's, I, Mr. Miracle, we always went back to the Kirby. Um, doing the movie now it's 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 going back to the kirby but uh, I, th I think walt's accomplishments are just beyond understand brilliant well i guess what i i was trying to get at is is do you, do you borrow certain elements from other writers and and incorporate them into your because you you have to redefine whether you're whether you're going to do the film version of it or 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 more comics uh versions of it you have to sort of define what is the canon you know oh, what yeah. is the what what is canonical? What what belongs in the universe? And you have to say what what is definitive. Is that difficult? And do you do you borrow and mix and match? And do you as writers have to adhere to a certain canonical fealty to what Kirby did, or are you allowed a lot of leeway to change things around? I'm going to go before Tom does because Tom has that extra added element of uh, of the film. The film stuff. So, and I'm sure that that that'll have a different spice uh, flavor yeah. on top of uh, of that. But for me, I really took um, Kirby's. That's where I. That's the space that I lived in, and mm. I really took the issue, um, Mister Miracle Number Nine, of Kirby's run, um, and exploded that issue out. So, you know, that issue is where um, where uh, you know Sc Scott and Barda have their meet cute at um, Himon's. Um, Place. And um, it is because Barda is trying to bring this woman back, or really, and that is there is no Scott and Barda without Mr. Miracle Number Nine. And for me, what I felt like, um, you know, there's this one uh, female fury, um, but it felt like so much of the story of the female furies and so much of the story of Granny Goodness was left sort of in the gutters. And right. so I just tried to, to sort of like sort of unfold that from there, like how did Granny become who she became? How did Barda, you know, because Barda's change of heart comes from what happens to Aureli in this moment, in mm. Mr. Miracle number nine. There, there is no, there is no for, there's no future for Scott and Barda if they don't have that, that moment. And if, if they don't, um, if Barda doesn't, re you know, realize how horrific her planet is and what, um, what Willix does to uh, to Aureli, which I didn't change in my book. It's exactly, he makes her dance to death in Kirby's. So I really, for me, I plucked panels from so many things like, um, you know, the, the 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 baby exchange, you know, with Orion and, and right. Scott, like everything, Tigra, Hegra, like uh, Beautiful Dreamer, everything that I put in my book is exactly from Kirby's. And I can point to, yeah, I mean, I don't know it off the top of my head anymore, but like I can say this panel specifically comes from this issue of the New Gods or of the Forever People or of, you know, whatever. And I really just tried to unfold that story and do it from, you know, just tell the story from the women's um, perspective. I love hearing that you are that specific. Oh, I mean, yeah. uh, from a writing perspective and, and for me as a reader, I love to know that, again, so much thought was put into what you were doing and, and how, and to, to, to go back to even specific panels. I mean, now that makes me want to go back and, and read your stuff again, <laughs> you know, or, uh, which is great. Well, what about you, Tom? It was, were you that specific? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were, but I, I think it's important, at least from my perspective, to say that 
what makes the the fourth world and the new gods and the Kirby stuff excellent is that it's a deeply flawed work. Um, like <laughs> if I wrote the introduction to the new absolute version, which is a gorgeous book. And I wanted to specifically say, like, if you approach this Wait a minute. Hang on a minute. That hasn't come out yet, has it? I have a copy. Yeah, I think it's out. Yeah, it absolute, out? Oh, yeah, it's Absolute Volume 1. It's it, if, you, if you take off the cover, it looks like a mother box. It's so freaking cool. I oh, I need to get... I don't have that. Oh, man, it's... <laughs> mm. I need to get that. Um, and, uh, and, flawed, and, and... Yes, agreed. It is flawed. There's yeah. some, oh, yeah. there's some flawed, deeply yes. messed up stuff in there. Well, I mean, beyond... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, there, there are deeply messed up stuff, but also it's, it's just like as a story, like if, if you were to sit down and just read it, mm -hmm. it's a chore. It's not, I don't want anyone to be like, oh my God, uh, I'm going to, like, like if you pick up, uh, if you're a comic book fan, you can give uh, the DKR to somebody. No, it, it, the story still works, even though it's 30 years later. This story doesn't really work. Doesn't I, work. I, I, it, you, you, there's, this is Jack Kirby editing himself mm -hmm. um, in a very angry place in his life where he just wanted, he's just like, I have a thousand ideas in my head and I'm going to blow them out. And so yeah. like, it only goes in this direction, that direction. And, and you're following one thread. You're like, wait, that, that thread went over here and this one. And now we're in, and now, and now, and then the tone switches. And you're like, well, now I'm a, a child's comic. Now I'm in a grown up's comic. Now, right. like, like it, it's just all, but that's, what's wonderful about it yeah. is that it's like, it's the white album. You're like, I don't want a, a song about piggies, but because they can do a song about piggies, they can do this other <laughs> experimental, you know, revolutions. Like it, it, there's nothing holding Kirby back. And I think a lot of people have come along after him and sort of, I mean, I mean, and, and tried to shape it and take the edges off and connect some of the, I mean, for example, the fourth world, that concept, what a cool title, the fourth world. But it, there's nothing in the book that says what the fourth world is. Yeah. It, right. it's that, literally that, even that, that phrase, there's no, what is the first three worlds? It's not yeah. in the book. Uh, I, I, totally. And what I find so interesting, you know, Tom, is that there are so many different threads that you can pull on and so many, like the first p thing that I pitched really was the Handmaid's Tale in the fourth world with Earth <laughs> and all that. And let me tell you, it was depressing. I mean, like, you know, everybody in DC was like, wow, this is really good. But because there's much stuff with lump and like the stuff that like he does on earth and when the female furies go there and like there's and like and then all those the the, the war that goes on like that earth and every, it's so um it's it's so massive um but uh and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense and then with this, the jimmy olsen stuff and superman and like <laughs> you know it's 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 quite a lot but i think what's so great about it is that there are so many deep ideas that i think kirby was um was trying to, you know, sort of get to. And so for me, that's why I say for me, I really just took that one issue and and blew it out um to make to make a whole, you know, to make a whole story. And um, you know, and I feel like Tom, you took um you took the elements of sort of trauma, you know, uh and um trying to make a life after trauma and sort of blew that up. So it's kind of like we get to occupy our own spaces and even though they're completely unconnected our two books i kind of like to look at them as like you know, they don't occupy the same space so they you can read them together Absolutely. and they make total sense but they're also completely unconnected you know um and i think that that's the that's the strength of when you have a big a big robust world to play in is that is that mm. um anybody can take up a thread and you can read all the extra pieces of it and it and 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 you understand what's sort of in the whole yeah well, it's, it's a little bit like reading the bible like i remember i mean whenever you're at, at that point in your life you're like i'm gonna read this people brag about this book like it's the bible so you're like you actually pick it up and start reading and there's a lot of bagots and this and the stories don't connect and and you're like ah this this is terrible writing i can't understand but then you're like but then you see little threads and you're like oh my god there's a huge story here and a huge yeah. story there it's very much the equivalent of that to me agreed when you you know you pitch a story and and i guess the editorial department or you're 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 given the go-ahead are you limited by what you can and can't do with established lore, or are you given pretty much carte blanche to do what you want? Do you, I mean, do you have to, are there limitations to how your imagination can, can go, or are you completely, you know, unfettered by where you want it? Like Handmaid's Tale in the Fourth World, that is a great pitch. And I'd be like, <laughs> you go, you go, girl. But did someone say, you can't go that far? 
I mean, no. I mean, the, when after I handed in my extremely depressing sort of genetic experiments, you know, um, <laughs> thing, um, I, you know, I, 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 we sort of landed on, um, uh, you know, the Me Too on Apocalypse, just to simplify the story. And basically, sure. it is the same thing. I mean, my story is basically The Handmaid's Tale and Me Too on Apocalypse, you know, while, mm -hmm. you know, staying in that world. But as far as I, once we landed on that, um, because I wasn't in continuity, I think the the sort of saying at DC, the unspoken saying at DC is like, it's not in, if you're out of continuity, it's not in continuity until they decide it's in continuity. So right. I kind of felt, I, you know, I felt completely free. I knew what my issues were. I knew, you know, I had six issues and I, I had my story and, and, and nobody, you know, everybody knew what I was doing. And I had a great editorial team, um, you know, Jamie Rich and Brittany Holzer and, um, and it was, you know, I mean, it was, it was I, unfettered for me. That's good to hear. I mean, again, the, the adding me too on apocalypse. I mean, my God, who wouldn't want to, what a great idea. <laughs> I, I can only imagine, I, I would love to have been on the receiving end of that pitch. I'd be like, yes, <laughs> let's do that. What about you, Tom? I, well, our book went slightly before Cecil. So we were yeah. sort of. Like by the time I feel Cecil's getting like black label had sort of become a thing and more mm. DC was exploring that stuff. Um, so when I started the book, I immediately told the editors, I was like, well, this is something that might be happening in his head or might be happening on another universe or might be happening. So don't worry about it. And for some reason they accepted that. I don't know. They weren't reading their emails that day, but <laughs> yes. They, so, so, so that, that sort of fiction and they never actually asked me like, is this real or is this not? Because they, they were like, anytime I did something extreme, they'd be like, oh, well, Tom told us it could be in his head. So, um, yeah, so I sort of, I hid behind that. And But by the time the series had finished, the whole concept of, I don't know, which, which to me was always the heart of DC, the Superman, uh, All-Star Superman, the DKRs, the Watchmen, sort of these limited series that are in continuity. If, like, like Cecil said, if they're good, then they become continuity. <laughs> um, but they live in their conception a little bit outside of having written myself a lot of incontinuity comics as, as a Cecil, these live a little bit outside of continuity in the fact that you don't have to deal with um, things that would interfere in sort of a complete vision. Right. Yeah, like, like crossovers and stuff like that. Like when Tom was writing Batman when I started writing Batgirl and I had to deal with what, he, you know, he's doing. That's what you have to do when you're in continuity. But when you're just a little bit outside of continuity, you have to stay true to the characters, of course. Like you can't just like you can't make Big Barda Little Barda all of a sudden, you know. Like, you I mean, I guess you could, but you'd have to have a good reason, you know. Um, but uh, you know, you have that's the that's the, the 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 thing that you have to 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 pay attention most to is is staying true to the character um, when when you're outside. Yeah, and I was coming, Tom. I was coming from the young animal thing, so I think you know right. they were like you know. They were like, yeah, do a six issue mini series that's, you know, out of continuity. And your book was a success. And so it was kind of like, it could be different, you know, but like people know the characters now or, you know, um, and also, you know, the Me Too movement was going on. That was when it was just beginning. And, you know, I know Adriana Mello, I want to give her a big shout out. Um, and I felt, you know, really called to, you know, sort of speak about things that, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, you know, there's a lot of things like when you read the female furies where it's like, yep, women are still talking about this. And I don't mean like women in the book. I mean, women in our world um, and, uh, you know, and those power dynamics. And I feel like, you know, the one thing I'm most proud of, and I think Adriana is as well, is that, you know, um, uh, Granny Goodness is a terrible person. She's the most horrible woman <laughs> in the world. And, I, she's the character that I feel the sorriest for, you know, because, because of, um, of, uh, you know, the, the, what I imagine Kirby, you know, actually put her through, because if you have it, just inherently, when you have, um, a character who's the only woman of the old guard of dark sides, you know, um, you know, cronies, the only woman, and she's the one put in charge of the orphanage. I mean, you know, you're gonna <laughs> like she's gonna be pissed, you know, and that's gonna shape her in some way. And so, um, to you know, and I feel like you know, women have felt like that for a long time, where you know, it's like you can't break that ceiling, no matter what you do. You're 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 given the woman's work, and how does that 
you know, how does that affect you as you grow older and bitter when you know that you could probably be a better leader of apocalypse than dark side? There, I said it. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I want, can you write Thank that you. comic? Granny goodness ascends to the leadership of apocalypse. Sure. I, I want to see, <laughs> I want to see that, that what a great idea that is. I mean, I, 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 especially in the, what, in the post me too movement, what happens on apocalypse when, when that dream is realized, I'd love to see that. But now what about the two of you? So how, how much does reader feedback or, or matter? Like when, does it matter to you or, 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 or do you not care? Uh, I care and it doesn't matter. Both things are, I think that's probably, the, uh, yes, I, I wish I didn't care. I wish when people said they hated something, I'm like, you know, fuck it. I'm an artist. I have to make what I make. Um, but I'm also an artist, so I, uh, I'm scared about what I do, and I'm never confident that anything is good. So when a lot of people don't like something, I, I try to, I see, I see what they don't like, and I can't help but seeing it. Um, but it is our literal professional jobs um, to not, to, to not just be um, uh, uh, leaves on the wind. You know, we, we, we have we have to sort of have a point of view, or else we're not going to make creative stuff. I mean, there have been tons of comic books that are leaves on the wind. They're, I mean, they're, they're all comic companies that are dedicated to that. And I have respect for them. You know, if you want to read old Charlton's comics from the seventies, whatever the trend was, <laughs> Charlton's was going to send 16 chief comics after it. But um, to make really good comics, I think you have to sort of have your perspective. I think um, I agree with Tom. Absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, you know, of course, you know, it, it, it kind of hurts your feelings sometimes, but <laughs> at the same time, that's our job, you know, is to, you know, put it out there and that's, you know, that's what we do. And, um, but I think for me, what was really hard was, you know, I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of hate for, um, you know, for what I did um, with the female furies. And um, that was, difficult because a lot of the comments were that I knew nothing about the fourth world. I didn't read, you know, any of Jack Kirby. I, I you know, I, I was disrespecting the characters. I knew nothing. I was stupid, you know, all these things. And that was painful because it was like, no, I, I actually could point to which panel yeah. in, in this, but like, I actually did do, you didn't do your homework, you know, <laughs> like I did my homework. That's frustrating because because I think Tom is the same. You know, we put a lot of care and thought into what we're doing and it's not willy nilly, you know, like, um, you know, when we make a choice about a character, you know, it's because we're making a we're making a decision about it um, and it's thoughtful. And um, and so when when, you know, and especially as a woman writing something that was, um, you know, fraught. Uh, that was that was difficult, and it, it didn't hurt my feelings because I I knew that I'd done my homework and that I yeah. knew what I was talking about. But it was annoying uh, and continues to be annoying um, because because uh, because there was so much specific thought into what I was doing, and I feel as though um, Jack Kirby and I would have a great conversation over like a whiskey about you know <laughs> about the female furies and about granny goodness and about beautiful dreamer and all the things that um that he did that he missed because he was of his time and that i picked up because i'm from my time and i think that you know tom come and have a like you know let's let's all go meet you and jack have a have a whiskey one day together um uh and and talk i think that would be a, a good conversation as well well you just touched on something that i think is is you know i've read comics for 40 years but what you just said about how you are bringing something in the concerns of our time today your time issues that matter to you and are adding them to a mythology that's existed for the well almost 50 years um is what continuing comics is all about i mean so often fans are mired in what they believe a character they're so I don't know, strict or stringent or whatever. They want this character to be just this way. And the thing that keeps a character vital is when it's reinterpreted for the, the modern age and what you both can bring to those characters and, and add to the mythology. And I, I think that's sometimes forgotten in, in you think about the great comics that you brought up, Tom, 
whether it was Dark Knight Returns, whether it's Frank Miller's Ronin, or whether it's Watchmen, or I mean, Watchmen took the, the it was going to be the Charlton the, the characters, and then they changed it, and then the Alan Moore got to take uh, you know it's not going to be Captain Adam or the Question, it's going to be Rorschach and and Doctor Manhattan, and if if you're not allowed to do that, then the comics medium and indeed the stories are sort of they are they're arrested and they don't they don't stay modern and they don't stay relevant. And I, I think it's really important, Cecil, so what you said about that and how you, you're you absolutely right. I think Kirby would have adored what you both had done. And and I'd like to hear more about that. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you take a character and bring a modern sensibility to that character yet still retain the core of who that character was when it was conceived, perhaps? Well, sometimes, I mean, there are comic writers, you guys are writing characters that are 80 years old now so how do you do that i think how you do your homework i think that's what you do you you go to the source material and and you read it like when i took over batgirl i read all of batgirl <laughs> when i did the female furies i read all of the you know all the fourth world when i did shade the changing girl i read the ditko shade the changing man and i read the milligan shade the changing man you do your homework you know and and you go in there and you yeah you, you crack it up and, and you put it through the lens of, of where we are now and you you try to be thoughtful and you bring your heart and you know you do you do the best you can and then you pass the baton on to the future so that somebody can pick something up in 20 30 years from what from what you from what you um, did no I wait I gotta break in this is Tevia uh, Smolka asks question for Tom and Cecil I, this is not fourth world related but I'm just wondering how you would bring back the question Renee Montoya back into the main universe. Wait, she's a, she just appeared in the Lois Lane comic by Greg Rucker. She's in the main universe. So if you're reading that Lois Lane comic, which is very good, uh, there's some Renee Montoya question in it. There you go. <laughs> back to the fourth <laughs> world then. <laughs> so, so, so Tom, do you feel the same way? I mean, do you go back and do that kind of research into the characters you're approaching? Yes, of course. Um, well, I mean, I, th I think what what I find interesting about that is is that you know to, to bring it back to the fourth world. Like, so the fourth world was created sixty seven, sixty eight by a guy in his mid fifties who had already done as much as you can do in comics, almost as much as you can do as a human being. If you put his war experience and his immigrant parents, all like his biography is insane. Um, but what's amazing about it is it's very contemporary. It's it's a it's it's Jack trying to take on 1967, mm -hmm. not him trying to recreate some high of superheroes in the 40s. So we have the Forever People. We have space hippies. We have a Black <laughs> Racer who's a Vietnam veteran, um, and we have uh, I mean the, the the entire concept of the characters. I mean it was very much Kirby himself in the spirit of the Fourth World was I'm going to create a story, but it's about today. Yes, it's fantastical, mm -hmm. but it's very contemporary as well. Uh, and so to me, this, if you came to the Kirby material and we're just, I'm going to make more stuff that's just like Kirby, you'd almost right. be not doing what Kirby did. You'd almost yeah. be defying him because he was trying to be modern. So if you're going to reject modernity, you're rejecting him in some way, um, in, in my opinion. Yeah, um, total, totally. And I think that's why it's like, when you think about the female furies, the female furies are so amazing you know and big bard i mean you know kirby loved women you know and he loved writing women but he was also writing it in 1967 you know so that was yeah. a different that's a you know his idea of what you know women's equality and women's liberation was was you know tempered by his time you know um and we know that that he wanted to do a female fury solo book there's a cover for it that he um that he penciled so, you know, it's not that he didn't want to tell those stories, but when you actually look at the female Furies, that they don't get as much screen time um, as, you know, or Big Barda, like uh, she gets more screen time than, you know, the female Furies, but, but um, you know, he was limited by what he was doing, but at the same time, he's looking at science, the science of the day, thinking about dark matter, thinking about, you know, astrophysics, thinking about the space program, thinking about, gene you know, uh, DNA, CRISPR technology before it even really existed. He's thinking about all of those things because that's what was cutting edge at his time. But, you know, there was only so much that we knew then about, you know, um, the, the, we hadn't even, we didn't even have a picture of Pluto yet, you know, so, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you can only do what you can do. So that's why I say, you know, it's sort of like, especially with comics, what you're doing is you're bringing it into the day that we're in 
and then you're 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 leaving some threads in a baton for someone you know down the line they're gonna take they're gonna take it up and 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 reinvent it for you know for for their day i mean i did the same thing with shade like i said you know i mean well, the fact that you read, you know, I, I remember e e even like when Vertigo first came out, when they made the transition, like Swamp Thing was a was a was a regular book, and then it transitioned over to Vertigo. And Neil Gaiman had done, I think, Black Orchid, and then he then he, he started on with Sandman. I mean, there was there was so much interesting innovation that was happening in like the eighties, and and comics were really starting to come into their own, and and with the direct sale market, and more more female readers were coming in. Uh, I think death, the character of death, brought brought a lot of, of female readers in. Now we're sort of in a in a in a transitional period where, uh, you know, with COVID and what's going on with the direct sale market, and it's it's a crazy time for comics. And it's really up to you, both of you, as innovative storytellers, to keep the medium going. Well, okay. Tom, Tom and I have talked about this. Because, um, you know, I mean, I also write young adult books and, um, mm. you know, I write young adult comic books. And I mean, you know, maybe the direct market is, you know, is, is uh, you know, fumbling a little bit. But, you know, the, 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 the YA kids um, um, book, comic books, I mean, is alive and well <laughs> and, and, right. doing, and doing great. So, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think I think I don't know. I, I'm sure we'll do what we can, but also I'm going to write more graphic novels as well because I like doing that as well. Sure. Well, what about you, Tom? I mean, you, you know, you've become a, a superstar and, and now you're working on what presumably seeing what's going on with the, the, I mean, even with the Snyder cut. I mean, Zack Snyder was on his way toward literally bringing the fourth world to the screen. We saw hints of it in Batman v Superman. Obviously now he's doing the Snyder cut. We, we just saw dark side in his first the first trailer you know what a great jumping onto the screen what does it mean for you are are you working with how, how do you approach the fourth world when you have somebody else sort of leading the way and and bringing bringing us i mean i, I gotta tell you as a longtime comic fan that one scene that the nightmare batman scene in batman v superman where where we actually see earth being turned into apocalypse with you know the omega the whatever the i don't know the on the ground i i, I lost my shit i'm like <laughs> oh my god like we're gonna see the fourth world on screen i mean i can't believe it now you you're writing it i i can't tell you as a as somebody who's a longtime fan what i, I mean and now we're gonna see dark side in the Zack snyder justice league I, i'm just beside myself what's it like for you to be at the forefront of writing this it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> it's just it's very stressful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't mean to touch on a sore subject. I just wanted to tell you I'm I'm excited. I, I am I am hugely excited. But if if I let my brain touch that, it's almost like when you're writing Batman. And it, so I'm, I'm sort of trained to do this. Like if I ever like let myself think, "Holy crap, I'm writing Batman!" I'll just stop writing. I'll be like, "I can't take this." <laughs> so I have to kind of compartmentalize that aspect of it and just focus on, okay, I just have to write a scene between two people. Or I, 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 I if, if, if it occurred to me, this stuff, you know, when I put this, I can't, I can't talk about the movie at all, right? It has to right. all be these of little not. platitudes and bullshit. So I apologize for that. So I'm just using, but like, if, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing a scene between two people, it's like, nobody's ever seen these two people on screen before. How can I, if I get distracted by that, I'll just be, I'll go crazy. So I just, I focus on the humanness and I try to create, I, I just, when it's over and on a screen and people are shouting, I'll realize the importance of all that stuff. But I have to, I have to put it to the side, or else I'll think you can never treat these characters as too precious, or else you won't dig into them. You know, you won't get into the you won't you won't find who they are as people. Um, so yeah, I think that's. But for, oh man, I mean, sometimes I look at these. I, I'm, I'm working on the movie right now. This week is a. Some days are comic week. Some days are movie week. Because I'm in a movie week right now, and um, yeah, and. Uh, it, it's it's insane that I'm I'm doing this for a living. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I can't. Well, I, mean, I literally cannot wait to see what you and Ava come up with. I'm really. I'm so so excited. Can't wait. Oh, I I'm a big collector of Hot Toys figures, which is like the Tiffany collection of action figures. And I would have never guessed. From <laughs> I uh, I have to tell you the idea of getting a, a big Barda and a, a Mr. Miracle figure because they're in a movie. Uh, Mr. Miracle has one of my favorites since I was a little kid, 
Mr. Miracle's costume, which really hasn't changed much, is is one of my favorite. And, and Big Barda, too. Those two costumes, uh, they appealed to me when I was very, very young, and they appealed to me as a middle-aged man with one foot in his grave. And if I could, <laughs> if I could get, if I could get those figures, because they I, to see them in a movie. I'm telling you, man, this is this is a this is childhood, this is childhood dreams made real. And and we live in this world where who would have thought, you know, I'm still amazed. People, if somebody asked me 20 years ago if I thought there'd be an Avengers movie, I'd be like, Tch. <laughs> right. no. I, I would like for their um, you know, I, I like Barbie dolls. I always have, and uh, you know, I have uh, all the Wonder Woman Barbie dolls, and um, I've got a Batgirl Barbie doll, and I would very much like to have a big Barda Barbie doll. So. Let's put that out into the How cool would that be? You know, I love when, yeah. when Barbie, I, I have a few, I've got a few, believe it or not, I have a few Barbie yeah, dolls from Star Trek do. Barbies, you know. I have those. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm a fan, and Tonner, Ta they don't make Tonner dolls anymore. I don't know if you saw the Tonner, they did a whole line of DC uh, female characters. Their Batgirl doll was amazing. Now they've gone out of business, but their, their figures are hugely huge on the secondary market but i'm with you now can i ask you since you brought it up do you have a favorite era of barbie dolls oh, oh me yeah. i mean i gotta go with my uh um uh i gotta go with my original barbie that i had in the 70s you know those are those are my uh those were my, my it was a ballerina barbie doll she had a great uh i think it was nutcracker sweet or something um so yeah i'm just gonna go i'm just gonna go 70s Tom, do you collect action figures? I know you've got some on your shelf behind you. I, my daughter, um, well, who's also back there, that's her firing a gun at Disneyland, um, uh, is, is love superhero toys. That's like her, uh, she's the my most, when I was a kid, you know, a typical Generation X, last year kid, like all I did all day was play G.I. Joe's and make adventures, which turned out to be the best training for what I do for a living. And I should just have yeah. gone to school and done that. Uh, but uh, my daughter takes after me and loves to sit on the floor with plastic. So I, anyone who knows, when I go to cons, I used to buy literal tons and tons of toys. So mostly the Justice League Unlimited toys are my daughter's favorites. Mm. And I think right now, I think I have them all, including the uh, the rare Big Barter one. I, maybe there's like one or two. But yeah, I'd like to yeah. get that. I'd like there's to get like that one. Them, so. Tom, we're, we were the same because that's what I did too. I mean, I just had like action figures and I mean, they all played together. The action figures, the Barbie dolls, the, <laughs> you know, the 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 Star Trek, uh, you know, Spock and Kirk. Um, sure. you know, everybody was everybody's boyfriend and girlfriend, big, small, you know, they all hung out and it was just world's. You know, I used to call it playing planets. And, um, you know, my mom would just find like action figures and dolls like in every room of the house. And I'd be like, don't touch it. They're about to go to war, you know. Man, I played with dolls the same way you did. And my sister had like the four story Barbie dream house with the elevator with the string that went up and down. And I would use that as like Bruce Wayne's house. So oh, I, mean, I, you know, I had to build that one Christmas or the whatever modern version of it. And it was the worst build I've ever done. It was <laughs> it was an all day Christmas thing where, you know, eventually you give up and you watch the YouTube video and you're just like, I hate life. And your kid's like, you want a cookie daddy? And you're like, I'm going to get this goddamn elevator working. Yes. Well, when you're a kid, they don't they never make civilian uh, play sets or anything. So, like, if you want to have Bruce Wayne go somewhere as Bruce Wayne. There's no, he doesn't have his Lambo to drive somewhere. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bummer because you can't do that. So you'd have to, as a, if you had a sister, you'd be like, Hey man, can I borrow your uh, Barbie Corvette and have Bruce Wayne, you know, drive somewhere to continue the adventures. I love that you said playing planets because I took over the house. Like I had stuff all over the place and you get there, you'd have a whole day long adventure and move from room to room in your house as you're playing it out in your head. Yeah. And to your point, I um, put a bat on my Barbie Corvette <laughs> to make it a Batmobile. So. <laughs> you nerd. <My laughs> Terrible. Now we, we, I've completely derailed this conversation. But, but no, but I want to answer Josilla's question here um, about Granny Goodness being um, formed by life. Do either of you have a desire to expound upon Dark Side? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be amazing. Like, you know, you know, Dark Side's, Dark Side's growing up. <laughs> How, I, I, I have. That. I go. I'll go the opposite way. I have no desire to. Uh, I feel like some people don't need the Stanley treatment. I feel like sometimes just evil exists, and that's how I feel about darks. And I get that from Julian Lytle, who's my 
all to go to on new guys. I should shout him out more often. Uh, he's now writing for DC Comics. Pick up his comics. Got something in the new Swamp Thing special. I guess. Uh, but yeah, I, I I like him as just pure evil. I like. I'd, I don't. I don't need to know his sad story. I'd be. I'd be really interested though in um you know the fact that um Hegra no yeah Hegra killed his true love Suli. Like, yeah, there's I'd all be, this. Stuff. I'd be. I'd be very interested in writing that story. You know, like the story, the the sort of tragic story of of Darkseid and Suli, and um and I feel like Hegra is really um. Uh, she's very fascinating as well because she, you know, was like sort of like had this, um, you know, seizing of power and 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 that sort of overthrow of her. I would, I would, I'm, I'm, I would like to, you know, somebody asked like, would you want to do more female furies after? No, I feel like you know that's done. But I would, I would love to go back and do, um, and do Hegra and uh, Suli and and Darkseid. Well, if you could, uh, like, just hearing what, how you came up with your ideas for the Female Fury series, uh, if you were going to go back and, like, examine certain panels and, and mm -hmm. delve into the canonical works of the fourth world to create that story you just described, I mean, I hope somebody's watching this stream and calls you up tomorrow and say, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to see that story. But I, I'm with Tom on one hand. You know, you don't need to know the origins of certain people, but what you just described to me is a story that's worth telling. And I, I would love to see you delve into that because who that that's fascinating. As you were telling it, I'm getting a like goosebumps going, oh, I want to see, I want to read this. And for me, it's about the, the woman's story of that. You know, it's like, how does Hegra try to keep onto her power, you know, in a world that doesn't want her to have power and, you know, who is Suli and whatever that. So that's always the lens that I'm going to, you know, sort of go to. So maybe in a way it's not, it's like what, what uh, Tom said, it's not so much dark side, how he became what he became, but that's sort of, a, um, that's the sort of pleasant uh, uh, extra that you get from telling this, you know, this, this, this truly sort of um, uh, power struggle between someone who loves somebody and someone who um, doesn't feel that they're appropriate for their son. No, I mean, uh, that to me is where the, the kernel of great ideas come from. Let me ask the two of you, you know, how do you, when you are, are when you come up with an idea and you know what you want to do, how do you approach writing? I was, I was talking to Rodney Barnes earlier. Do you guys, do you guys write on note cards? I mean, how do you do you outline? Do you just start? Are you a, a pantser? Do you write by the seat of your pants? How do you both approach Writing a comic. Who, who you want to go first? Oh, you. Me. Oh, oh. Uh, I am. I am. Um, uh, I do not do. Out, I don't do detailed outlines. Uh, I do them in my head, and I have this theory, and it's the stupidest writer theory anyone ever came up with. And I think <laughs> I'm the only writer who has it. That if I have an idea in my head and it doesn't stick there, then it wasn't a good idea. I. I, I totally agree. You agree? Oh, it's I you and me. Totally We're the only ones. I don't. Yeah, these people keep notebooks by their bed in case they wake up in the middle of the night and so they can write down the one line. I'm like, if I if I wake up in the have a great idea and it's not there in the morning, it wasn't worth it. I do. <laughs> I do. I do have a. Um, uh, I I feel the same way. I mean, I do have a notebook with me and I do write some ideas down, but I don't wake up in the middle of the night and write them down. I do feel. I had a friend who, uh, and I like. She claims that she would write a first draft of her novels. And then she would delete the entire manuscript and rewrite the draft. And whatever she remembered was what really was supposed to be in the story. Now, wow. I'm not that brave, but um, but I do but I do think that there is merit to the idea that if an idea really is the right, it'll bloom again, um, you know, uh, it, you know, in 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 some way. So I'm with you, Tom. I lost my first novel once crowded sky which is not which is not good but it was it was a real novel i read uh, it oh pff, nerd uh and uh <laughs> i lost the last half of it or so a computer broke down and i, mm -hmm. I lost and i and oh and then once you know ever i you know i went to like these underground people, please scrape this off my hard drive and they couldn't find it and i had to i had to rewrite it from memory oh, God. Uh, uh when i was a baby writer i didn't know all the tricks you do to avoid that um so uh, I, I wonder if it was better or worse for it. Who knows? I guess I have I a think, career, so it's I think okay. It's the, I think it's the, I think it's the um, same thing. And, and the reason why I read it is because we remember I, I, I did that hybrid panel that we were on, you know, where it was like hybrid novels that I, that I put together. You remember that? Yeah. 
yeah. So, you know, so of course, you know, I had to do my homework. I'm, I do my homework. Um, so, uh, yes, the, I do not write outlines either, except um, I do like for, you know, for Batgirl and stuff, I, I did have to write like things um, out because things were changing all the time. And so that was very different for me. I'm more of a pantser. Um, what I'll do is I'll write my favorite scenes. I usually write the end uh, if it's a creator own thing, like I'll write the end, uh, mm. the, the last paragraph, the last line of a novel or a, a graphic novel first. Um, so that that's kind of my North star to sail by. And then I just kind of start writing my favorite scenes and, uh, and then I have a skinny skeleton and then I fatten up the baby. <laughs> now, do you approach comic mm -hmm. writing and, and, and prose writing in the same way? I don't really know anymore because I've been, I have, I have, I, it's been like a two, three, two and a half years since I've written a novel. Um, I, mm. I'm just beginning to like get back into prose because I miss it a little bit. So I want to write a new novel. So I don't know, but I, I'm sure Tom will say the same thing. Every project is different. And I don't know about you, Tom, but every project, you know, everyone always says like, oh, you've done this a thousand times before. You know, you know how to write a book or you know how to write a comic. And every, I'm like, but this is a totally new story. I don't know if I know how to write this story. So it's always, it always feels like you're starting at zero every single time because you're pulling a new world out of your brain, you know? Um, uh, one of our one of our viewers, I think they, their view their their comment disappeared. Meow Ryan, I think it was, said, "Yeah, here it is." Since Tom and Cecil, you're jazz musicians yes, in terms of your that. writing. I love that too. I think that's great. Would would you? And as a musician yourself, I don't know, Tom, are you also a musician? No, my brother is a musician. My brother's a professional musician. I am not. He got all. I mean, that. I. I love the idea, ja writing writing as a ja as a jazz form. I mean, I'm a huge jazz fan, so well, I, I love that. I think, I mean, Gerard Way and I talk about it a lot, like um, having been in bands and writing comics. That um, that writing comics is the closest other art that I've come to that feels like being in a band when you're collaborating. When you have a great collaboration with the artist that you're working with, um, it is like jazz. It is like a jam session, you know, where you're both sort of you know, feeding into ideas um, for each other. I, I know Tom has great relationships with the artists that he works with as well. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just a, it, it's just a pure, pure joy. So for me, it does feel like being in a band again. Uh, one of our viewers, dis the, the thing disappeared. They said, you be be bopping and scatting <laughs> and I'm losing it. Uh, Joe Zilla said that. Uh, I, lo I love that idea. Now, is it still possible when you are working on, on, a DC property like the fourth world, are you, can you still bring that sort of, well, I, I don't know, jazz ethos, you know, that free form, don't they want to know what you're doing? And, and, and is it, is it ever when you're working on the fourth world or something that maybe a Batman or a Batgirl, are you constrained a little bit because they want to know what you're doing? Like you can't just fly by the seat of your pants as much as you might want to does it does it ever become limiting when you're working on on these these properties well i can say yeah because you know for batgirl i had to when i first came on batgirl i was in year of the villain city of bane and uh <laughs> and leviathan and wow. so i had to you know so my best laid plans were i had to i had to do a lot of a lot of skating um you know <laughs> so yeah. um you know, that, that, yes, you have to, you have to, for me, at least for Batgirl, because she's not the, you know, she's not the driving engine, um, you know, in the DC universe is you have to, um, you have to be ready to surf with whatever's going on. And, um, and so they, you know, and you also have to be ready to throw out every idea that you have, because suddenly, you know, like suddenly I was in the Joker war. And so now I had, you know, I had to, I had to deal with that. So you're, you know, if you're always have to, um, come up with i you have to be an idea generator you know they say okay that was a great idea we we'll, you know we you can use that somewhere down the line or never but you came up with that idea good for you and um now you have to come up with another idea because here's the parameter that you have now mm. you know lex luthor's doing this or you know bane is doing this or you know whatever and and how are you going to live in that world yeah, it it's funny cuz um it's almost the opposite of what you would say. Cause I, I did Grayson, um, mm -hmm. and and when you're on, but there's like, yeah, when you, when you're on a book like a Grayson or a Batgirl, 
like editorial is much more in your face than when you're on a Batman or of course Black Label, because you have to conform to sort of this rest of the universe yeah. that's being built. And um, and then if you build yourself an outline where you're like, I'm going to stick to this outline, you're fucked because <laughs> your outline is going to fall apart. I learned this on great because uh, Tim and not Tim Seeley and I, who was my brilliant co-writer on that, we would make these detailed outlines of where this book was going. And every two issues, we'd get a phone call being like, oh, uh, uh, Jeff's doing this, <laughs> Scott's doing this. Yes. Um, and then you'd be like, well, we just created this. So that, yes. I think that's when sort of I, having that being my first book, I, that's when I sort of realized that like, uh, there's a limitation to the use utility of outlines in comics and that, that the yeah. real focus should be on making the best single issue you possibly can for this moment. Sort of. Yeah. And that's why I say you have to be an idea generator. And I think that's probably the good news that Tom and I have learned is that, you know, is that, um, you know, is that you, you just, you just keep, you know, the, the gauntlet keeps getting thrown down and you just keep, you just keep picking it up and coming up with something. And it, it makes you, you know, sharp in, in one way and sort of infuriated in another way. But, um, but, you know, but it's a, it's a great and interesting, uh, interesting challenge, but it does make it then, um, a lot more freeing when you're, when I, like when I was doing shade or when I was doing female furies and I'm sort of in my own pocket. And so I get to be the queen and call, call the, you know, make the calls. We are, we, this has been, again, these hour-long panels seem like they went by in the blink of an eye. If there's one last thought you could give both of you to our uh, our watchers, people that haven't read The Fourth World, what can you tell them? What, can you tell them why they should read it? That's an extremely good question. I'm going to ignore it and say this instead. Uh, I am doing a signing on Election Day in Philadelphia at Fat Jack's. Um, and if you vote, you get a free comic. So I just want to promote that. It's on 11.3. I'll be there 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with a mask on. If you don't want to wait in line because there's a whole plague going on, I have free pre-signed comics. So if you voted, you're in Pennsylvania, come get a free comic. Fat That's Jack's very, down Philly. Thank you. I, I've already <laughs> voted here, so every, everybody vote. So, yes. Well, I'm going to say that, um, you know, like Tom said, uh, you know, you should read the omnibus if you really want to get sort of the whole overview. But I think you should read um, Mr. Miracle. Uh, and um, so you know, good. because I think you'll get, you know, thing, and I know that that one, you know, is, is, is very, very well known and very well read. And maybe people have not read the female furies, you know, as much. And I would, I would, I would wager that you would like the female furies as well as, uh, you know, as fraught as it is. So, um, so for all of you who love Mr. Miracle, um, I think you should read the female furies. Cecil, everybody in the comment section has been blowing up about the female furies. As they uh, should. From 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 start from the start of this panel to the end. I just want to say Thank one you. thing because I've been directing this whole thing from the background. I'm 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 right now staring at Mr. Uh, Tom Brevoort and Mark Wade who have been sitting in the backstage for about ten minutes and just sitting there just nodding their head. Like <laughs> everything you guys are saying, you got Mark Wade and Tom Brevoort back there just being like, "Yep, hi yep, guys, everything they're saying is correct." Yep, yep. So take that, you know, for what it's worth. Mark, I, I have some you. of the original art from Mark Wade Conk sitting next to my desk. There he is. Thank you, so both, both Cecil and Tom. This was such a, it was a real honor and a pleasure for me to moderate this conversation. And I, I, I love your work, and and it was terrific to meet both of you, if only over the internet. And uh, one day, I'd love to meet you both in person and have you sign something of yours that I own. Thank you. So. And and once again, this was really a. This has been my wish to have this kind of conversation about the fourth world with um with Tom. So this was a really great birthday present. So thank you. And you, you couldn't have asked for a better moderator. I mean, if anybody yes, loves uh the fourth world and the dark and side of the entire Kirby universe, it's Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. It's true. <laughs> and one day, one day over that beer, we'll talk about Star Wars. Oh man, I would love to do that. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take about a one-minute break as we kind of queue up the next uh, next panel. It's uh, Mr. Tom Brevoort and Mark Wade talking about the Marvel Universe. Uh, thanks to all of you guys. Awesome. Rob, I'll let you uh, – hey, man, stick around and listen. <laughs> I know. I, I, hey, I love it. I, I just want to thank the Baltimore Comic Con and the Mainframe Comic Con. This is the fourth time I've worked for you guys. You guys are – I don't even work for you. I do it voluntarily. But it's so great. You put on such a great show. Thank you for all the work you do. You're very welcome, and thank you guys. And we, I'm sure we're going to do this again. I, I guarantee we're going to do this again, guys. So stick around. We got about uh, four more hours of Baltimore Comic Con tonight. So uh, stick around. Uh, we'll see you guys in a little bit. <laughs>